we see a very similar baseline growth trends over the last 10 years. Uh, production consumption growth of about 1% a year. Uh, baseline expansion in trading stocks on the range of about uh, 3%. Um, increased year to year variation in production and prices. Um, the, the driver here, I think, on the year to year variation is going to be effects of climate change, uh, extreme uh, weather phenomena, uh, the increasing uh, linkage to biofuels, the, the U.S. biofuels mandate, um, and just the growth in, in that sector. Um, volatility in energy prices, and uh, then secondly, I think uh, differential and lumpy adoption and acceptance of new technologies, uh, hybrids and, and biotech uh, varieties and down the line. So, a re relatively uh, a boring slide here, uh, again suggesting production and consumption out to 2019, 2020. Um, projecting uh, about a 1% growth in, in supply and use, those uh, more or less keeping up with each other, uh, but with trade expanding uh, up to about 40 million, uh, we think this is possible uh, <coughs> and it would imply about a 3.2% growth. So if you look at uh, this this year's projections, we're looking at about a, uh, 30, uh, about a 25 uh, million uh, metric ton increase in milled output, um, and about a, a 43 uh, million uh, increase in total supply. Uh, a fairly significant expansion in, in trade, but certainly uh, relatively consistent with what we've seen at least over the last 15 years. Uh, total use of 474 and ending stocks at, uh, uh, actually this is a, this number is a minus should be 115. <coughs> In terms of uncertainties and challenges for trade prices, um, variability uh, based on random disturbances in yields are simulated in our models uh, through price and trade adjustments. Uh, and uh, this allows us then to uh, look at impacts of policy reforms as well as institutional reforms. If we look at uh, the stochastic simulation of the world reference price over this 10 year period, <coughs> this was our baseline projection actually a, a year ago, but uh, the key point I want to make is that we get a confidence interval uh, from 10% up to 90% here with a, a variation only <coughs> by holding policies constant, but only looking at yield, random yield disturbances of, uh, of this difference here of over $100 uh, per metric ton within that confidence interval. The variability of, uh, and the stochastic simulation for Thailand uh, has a, a range of about um, a, a million a little bit over a million uh, in terms of capturing uh, this 90% uh, confidence interval uh, for trade. But we see uh, a relatively uh, continued growth in trade up to a little over 12 million metric tons out by the end of this decade. One of the, the significant sources of instability uh, that we see uh, based upon the empirical uh, distributions, yield distributions, and, and the, the, the response within our model is uh, India rice exports with a variation of essentially zero exports uh, with the potential up to 10 or 12 million, depending upon their production and, and the rest of the world's yields. We simulate the, uh, this model with uh, correlated uh, yields across countries and across time uh, to capture this uh, stochastic variation here in terms of trade. <coughs> but you can imagine that uh, this kind of variation uh, here is a significant source of, uh, of shock uh, for prices. Uh, finally, uh, uh, on the importer side, um, we see again a fairly significant range 
year um, in the confidence interval for Philippine, uh, this should be rice imports. Sorry about that. So I put it's a uh, net rice imports uh, ranging from two and a half up to four million, uh, depending upon uh, disturbances in, in yields. So basic, uh, um, another issue, of course, that I think that um, what lies in the head is, is uh, whether or not we'll have a conclusion to the Doha reforms, any of these multilateral um, approaches to trade. As we know, the dominant distortion in worldwide trade is market access, high tariffs and limiting TRQs. Uh, there was mentioned in the previous session about the South-South conflicts, uh, major beneficiaries to trade reform uh, <coughs> with rice trade uh, market access reform would be Southeast Asian long grain rice exporters uh, and Asian and African rice consumers. Uh, medium grain trade, North-North conflicts, uh, essentially U.S., Australia, Northeast China, Egypt, uh, and the consumers benefiting in Japan, Korea, and Taiwan. This is a somewhat dated analysis, but it suggests uh, basically about a 5 million metric ton expansion in trade if we were to experience any movement towards uh, opening up market reform. I looked at the three different scenarios here, uh, opening up market access with the reductions of tariffs, the elimination of the subsidies, subsidies and global rise are really becoming relatively ins insignificant in terms of uh, trade distorting uh, impacts. Uh, domestic supports, similar, are relatively insignificant. Uh, but the aggregate, uh, again, if you were to look at all reform in all three policies, uh, an expansion of about 5 million above uh, current baseline levels. For prices, uh, we would see maybe about a $50 uh, premium for exporters and about a $30, $30 uh, reduction for importers and as high, and that, that's how we, uh, for long grain and for the medium grain markets, uh, maybe as high as an $80 uh, discount over current prices. I want to close with just a bit of a discussion of what I view to be needed institutional and, and information reforms. Um, when we look at uh, sort of how the global rice market is performing, there's clearly a need for group transparency. Um, my view is that a major source of uh, instability in the global rice market is, is the, the presence and, uh, and, and continued interaction of state trading uh, in a number of Asian countries. There's <coughs> In, as a substitute to the state trading, there's clearly a need for increased uh, role in the private sector and uh, certainly following the circumstances of the 2008 uh, rice crisis, I think improved reporting and market analysis by Asian and global media uh, would be a significant uh, help in terms of providing improved transparency. Regional market stabilization institutions, uh, I think there certainly is a, a role for that, uh, but I think a considerable amount of research needs to be done. One, to look at uh, what is the potential role for futures markets. This needs to be explored. Um, right now, I can say that the U.S. futures market in rice is performing extremely poorly. Um, it's uh, being uh, bought into heavily by speculators and hedge funds. <laughs> Uh, and, and we see a huge, uh, very unreliable margin, uh, delivery margin uh, for farmers, and so it's really not a very useful hedge tool at this point. Um, and, uh, suggesting uh, 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 significant problems. One of the fundamental problems with the U.S. rice futures market is uh, is a, a, a relatively poorly designed uh, set of delivery points for that futures market. Uh, secondly, in terms of uh, regional institutions, I think we need to explore a more effective regional rice reserve system. It needs to be looked at from uh, alternative uh, trigger mechanisms and uh, implementation issues. 
needed institutional productivity reforms. The GRISP, uh, which is uh, just uh, to be announced, uh, I think will go a long way to addressing and funding the R&D gap that has resulted in the low yield growth in recent years. Um, you'll hear more about that uh, here in, I think, over the next couple of days. Um, but there's clearly a need for the research to focus on climate change and production systems that address higher temperatures and weather events. Um, this year, certainly the, the U.S. Uh, had significant problems with drought uh, and, uh, and heat, uh, which had a very dramatic effect upon the supply of our, our market. And uh, I think another uh, important issue of looking at sort of productivity uh, gains is to explore the roles of public and private research institutes in development and provision of, of hybrid varieties. So in summary, I think we can uh, say that uh, sort of the current environment is that it's a very thinly traded rice market, remains vulnerable to market policy shocks. The current record production uh, exists, but uh, prices are strengthening uh, in large part uh, again to this thinness uh, within the market. Uh, and the importance of weather events in terms of driving price behavior. Uh, the near-term outlook uh, implies modest growth in production consumption, trading stocks, um, but also a bit higher prices. Primary challenges in the global rice market is looking at variability in yields and consequently prices and trade as a result of weather. Um, addressing this in a policy uh, framework, I think it looks uh, as if we need to explore again and, and push for expanded market access, improved market transparency, including reducing the role of state trading, improving market information by the media, um, and research to focus on adaptation mitigation to climate change, and improved understanding of the linkages of rice and other grain markets to the energy markets. 